I absolutely love war memorials, and as you are all, I'm sure, well aware by this point, I'm also very good at over-analyzing things, and so I figured why not take these two, shall we say, peculiar traits and uh, combine them into one for a nice little video topic, or at least it was meant to be a little topic, but then I rapidly realized, oh, I have about, uh, what, five or six pages worth of notes in front of me here, so it may actually take a little bit longer than first intended, but here's hoping that uh, there is some notes of interest in all of this. Today we have for our consideration the Monument and War Memorial to commemorate the British involvement in the Gulf War, the Iraq War, and the Afghanistan War, so we're talking 1990 up until the present day, really. Uh, it was designed by the sculptor Paul Day and unveiled by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the 9th of March 2017 down in Victoria Embankment Gardens in London. Now, before I get started uh, speaking about the actual details of the monument, I do just want to say that I absolutely love it. It is a beautiful, beautiful piece of art, and uh, is, I think, very fitting, very suiting to the sacrifices made by British uh, servicemen and women in those regions of the world. Uh, I think, also, it is a very old style of memorial. It, it's, it's a very interesting piece in that it seems to harken back to a more Victorian way of portraying conflict, and we'll get to exactly what I mean by that in a bit more detail later on in the video, but for now, let's talk about the actual details of the piece. Now, the face side of the monument features three soldiers looking out into the distance with their weapons at the ready in the middle of what uh, appears to be some sort of a barren, well, desert. Meanwhile, in the background, four of their comrades are carrying something, what, what appears to be a wounded soldier, back into a helicopter, which is in the process of landing in the distance, uh, very clearly throwing up great clouds of dust and uh, debris and whatnot. Now, of course, our immediate vision is drawn to the foremost soldier, and especially, I think, his eyes, which are very striking. And I think his eyes are very, very noteworthy, especially in comparison to a lot of other uh, similar styled memorials. As we see in the exceptional detail that was put into the man's face, a look of both weariness, as his eyes are, are bagged and wrinkled, you can see, but also of a, a very pointed sort of determination, as he's very clearly focused very firmly and very strongly on whatever it is that is sitting in front of him. Aside from his striking eyes, special detail seems to have been given to his rifle, which rather than many alternative portrayals of soldiers, which provide more simplistic views of their actual weaponry, we see almost every single detail on the piece, from, from the dials on the weapon sights to the mechanism which keeps his magazine in place, there's a great deal of uh, detail that was put into showing this man's firearm. We also see that the soldier's fist is very tightly clenched around the grip of his firearm. Uh, now toss this in with the uh, exceptional details present in the man's clothing and in his helmet, and the, the real militant nature of this man's presence is being very clearly and strongly emphasized. Naturally, a flag on his uniform faces to the fore, appearing to almost patriotically wave in the breeze as it sits on the scrunched up clothing. Now I'm overanalyzing, I'm well aware, but when I see this uh, image of the flag alongside the clearly wounded man in the distance, I'm reminded of the old adage that the colors do not wave by the blowing of the wind, but by the dying breaths of her fallen, which I think very much uh, uh, fits in with the overall theme of the monument, whether or not that sort of double meaning was intentional or not. The other two soldiers are very similarly detailed, although naturally to a slightly lesser extent given that they are slightly further away. Focusing on the center man, we can see that his chin is held up and his footing seems to suggest some sort of activity. He, he looks as though he's ready to rise or perhaps to burst forward with uh, some sort of motion. Uh, meanwhile, the man most distant and noteworthy here, closest to the wounded soldier, seems more grounded. His feet are planted very firmly in a firing position, and his head is tucked inwards towards his body. He overall seems much more hunched down and grounded, if you will, than the other. These two men, when taken in one image, show, on one hand, the dedication and honor of service, sort of the prestige and the pride, and on the other side, the weight 
of sacrifice and duty which must weigh down on the individuals who go out on deployment like this. As we zoom out from this center detail, we see that this face of the monument reads very simply Iraq and Afghanistan in bold capitalized letters. Moving now to the obverse side of the monument, things begin to get a little bit more complex, as of course we see a lot more detail on this side, and it's dealing with the slightly more, shall we say, uh, complicated narrative of the humanitarian efforts of the British involvement in those regions. So starting off in the top left-hand corner of the memorial, we have uh, two gentlemen, I assume British officers or officials of some sort, who uh, are negotiating, it seems, with uh, native elders. Now, what I find most immediately striking about this image uh, would be the very sharp distinction that we see between these two sides. You can rather immediately tell which ones are the British and which ones are the natives. Now, one of the Britons we can see very clearly is a bit of an older gentleman, and the other one behind is just a bit younger. They each of them have very well-defined and, I think, proportioned uh, features with short and very well-groomed hair, especially given the region that they're in. They seem to exude the same sort of pointedness and confidence which these soldiers on the other side held in their own gazes, with perhaps an added note of compassion in how the older man's eyes do seem gentler in a way, because they're, they're more rounded, you can see, when compared to, uh, to his younger counterpart's own. He also seems to be tilting his head back ever so slightly, as if in a, in a sort of position of, of power to those uh, people who are opposite to him. He's expectant, in a way, of these people coming before him. It actually reminds me a bit, and this might be a little bit too far, I acknowledge, but it rather reminds me of this portrayal of Field Marshal Wolseley accepting the surrender of Ashanti tribals. I think when we look at both of these pieces, the faces of the men involved, of, of the British men, exude the same sort of self-confidence and, again, expectation that uh, they are in something of a dominant or, uh, or superior in some fashion uh, position. In a very stark contrast to these two Britons, look at the men they're dealing with. The native leaders are all very clearly much older and, and more weathered in their skin. They are less healthy or, or active, so to say, in their appearances. Their faces are, are wrinkled with very angular and, and pointed features. While the British gentleman seems to be drawing these men in with an open palm and the same expectant yet compassionate look, these men are very clearly leaning inwards towards the Briton with uh, crooked bodies. Their hand gestures indicate a sort of hesitant curiosity and a quizzical examining of these foreigners and whatever it is they may be proposing. In the background observing these proceedings, we have two men and two women, all of whom uh, have a look of what seems to be apprehension. The negotiations being carried out are clearly uh, precarious and of a very important nature. Especially noteworthy of these onlookers would be the person who is recording the uh, negotiations, being a young woman, and this is a theme which we'll see repeated on a few counts through the monument as we, as we proceed through it. Uh, so, moving on. Just below that, in the lower left-hand corner, we have, I think, the most fascinating part of the entire monument. We see two British men and two British women are distributing boxes of aid and supplies, uh, very clearly marked with a large Union flag. I should first like to make note of the uh, very stark distinction between the women uh, shown in this part of the memorial. Because, as usual, the British features are very well proportioned and their hair is, while still very clearly effeminate, tied at the back, which, much like the rolled up sleeves, shows a sort of, uh, a sort of work needing to be done, you know, a sort of getting down to business to to, to see the, the duties of the day carried out. While on the other side, we see them handing off these boxes of aid to women in full Islamic veils. Now, two of these native women are turned away. Presumably, they are bringing back boxes of supplies to their people, while a third woman is accepting another box, although the Briton is still very clearly bearing the brunt of the weight of this aid, as it has not yet been fully handed over to the native woman. Naturally, we can't see the British women's faces 
all too well because of the distance at which they are working, you know, their size relative to the rest of the memorial, but they seem to have these sort of uh, plain expressions of carrying out one's duty, of just getting a job done. Now, as we move on, we come to, I think, the most fascinating part of the entire monument, and it would be this man right here. Now, before I made this video, I had something of a suspicion about the appearance of this man, and so to test it, I sent out cropped images of the figure to a few of my friends. Now, the first one immediately identified this. I asked them, uh, tell me where you think this monument, uh, you know, what nation made this monument and what time period you think it's coming from. The first one immediately identified him either as a Soviet worker of some sort from immediately after the, uh, the Second World War, either that or as a German equivalent just before the First World War. Again, a sort of a proletarian worker. Uh, he does, after all, as it was pointed out to me rather specifically by this friend, look rather ubermenchy or, or pretty Aryan, as it were, in his, in his features. My second friend also identified it as coming from probably one of the world wars, saying it was probably either Russian or German, and the third friend was slightly different. He thought that it looked rather like a World War I bit of propaganda, maybe portraying some sort of an engineer or, or logistics worker, uh, man, you know, given the, the clothing and the uniform he seemed to be wearing, which looked indeed as some sort of a workman's outfit. Now, I don't blame any of my friends for these sorts of conclusions that, oh, well, clearly this is some sort of, you know, very early 20th century portrayal of a, uh, of an honest, like, working man of, of the new, like, of some sort of totalitarian regime portrayal of the perfect citizen, as it were, as he really does seem to exude this sort of propaganda y feel, this sort of perfect masculine example of the new British man, or, you know, whatever you want to phrase it as. Uh, his position, his features, especially the well-defined jawline and the squareness of his build as he's, you know, hauling a box, as it were, all exude this sort of martial hyper-masculinity which so heavily dominated the early 20th century, especially in those propaganda images. For this reason, this is by far my favorite aspect of the monument, I think the most fascinating part of it, just because of the older style which it seems to have been carried out in. Now, moving on to the upper right-hand corner, and hopefully a little bit faster, we're going to speed it up now. We have uh, native figures being shown how to operate a water pump. An older gentleman is working at the pump, he's clearly a native, while a Briton kneels at the spigot down below with a younger native man. It may be noteworthy here that the Briton is the one collecting the water, with the younger native man seemingly reaching out to accept the, uh, the dish or the bowl that's being used to collect it. Uh, looking onwards, we have another man leaning in, reaching towards the water in what almost looks like a sort of uh, religious reverence for the resource, you know, given the uh, posture and the positioning. It looks very much like a stained glass window type of design, you know. Another man stands just behind him with a shovel, clearly weary from the work of digging the well, but also appreciating the fruit of uh, this his labor. Further behind, an older woman, her face clearly on display, watches the proceedings with an expression of possibly a sort of weary thankfulness, which I think is a bit more well pronounced in the man at the pump uh, just to her right. Continuing on down the monument, we have the uh, simplest image present of three young girls reading and writing, an image of the same feminine empowerment which has so massively dominated the narrative of development in the entirety of the Middle East, let alone in these regions of specific British involvement. Of course, the image of the young girl being able to go to school and learn has been so heavily uh, present, so to say, in our humanitarian efforts in these regions. Now, the most noteworthy thing about this aspect of the memorial it is that it's the only scene on the entire monument, on both sides, in which there is not a Briton present. They are not receiving this aid or development by, by virtue of some foreigner who's coming in and, you know, uh, teaching them at the blackboard. You know, there are no Britons here present giving some sort of lesson or teaching them how to read, but rather through their own means, by their own virtue and their own innate abilities, which are enabled or allowed to flourish by the enlightening introduction of the Western liberal ideals. 
Finally, we have just below in the lower right-hand corner a British woman providing medical care to a native child uh, being held by a woman, presumably the boy's mother. Now, the British woman is clearly administering some sort of medical aid, although I can't quite tell what kind of aid it is. At first, I thought it would be a pill or a dropper of some sort, although now that I look at it, it seems to be uh, perhaps she's shining a light down the child's throat. She's clearly very focused on the task at hand and is helping keep the boy's mouth open with a gentle touch to his chin. And while the child's expression is uh, clearly rather odd, you know, likely not fully understanding uh, you know, what's going on, the way that you know children so rarely do during such medical affairs, uh, he doesn't appear to be in any sort of stress or undue pain. Watching the affair from just behind their mother, another child seems to be uh, a bit less happy with how things are proceeding, although this may simply be a shyness and curiosity regarding the strange woman and her medical tools. Meanwhile, the mother is gazing down lovingly as she holds her child's head back, uh, not at all forcefully though. Again, there seems to be an overall feeling of gentleness and tranquility in this portrayal. While the woman's headscarf and well-defined features clearly mark her as a native, her positioning and the context in which she's been placed into the piece seems to hearken images of the Virgin Mary in a fashion. Given the positioning of her hand, the way that she's leaning down, it very much does look like something out of a religious work, much like the water portrayal that we saw earlier. And I'm sure that the uh, similarities between this piece and some portrayals of, for example, the Virgin Mary were not lost on the artist. Just behind this mother, we see another woman looking off into the distance, sort of taking in all that the monument seems to be offering, and particularly the three studying girls, perhaps with a sort of hope that one of them one day might be administering the same aid for the future children that the foreign woman is now offering. Stretching out to the wider face of the monument, this side reads simply duty and service. As you may have noticed already, the entire monument is taking the shape of a coin, representing, of course, the equal significance of the martial and humanitarian aspects of the British presence in these regions. They are two sides of the same coin. Rather, you know, rather clever there, I think. This coin is placed in between two monolithic slabs of Portland stone, which, while smooth at their faces, are rough and almost unfinished on the outside. Uh, officially, this represents the terrain of the regions involved, you know, the mountains of Afghanistan and whatnot, although I imagine that, the, uh, that, that there's also some significance or some meaning behind it being an unfinished mission. Now wrapping up, like I said, this video was originally meant to be much, much shorter, but there is just so much more to this memorial than I first thought. Keep in mind just how modern this monument really is. It was unveiled this year, 2017, and yet so many of the sentiments and portrayals in it exude a sort of Victorian, wiggish, even slightly triumphalist feeling. Just alter the clothing and equipment of a few of these individuals, and so much of this memorial, it seems, could well be a sort of dedication to imperial forces, in a sense, uh, similar to, I think, the Albert Memorial over in Hyde Park. The obverse side especially seems to just scream the phrase, white man's burden, in just a more modern light, really, in which the phrase has merely uh, transferred or been updated to become take up the Western burden. This is truly, and I absolutely love to say this, a much older, a, a truly Victorian style of monument in a wholly modern setting, and an excellent dedication and memorialization to the British efforts in these regions of the world. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.